Good evening, and welcome to the Crypto Overnighter. I'm Nicodemus, and I will be your host as we take a look at the latest cryptocurrency news and analysis. So sit back, relax, and let's get started. And remember, none of this is financial advice. And it's 10 p.m. on Tuesday, October 3rd, 2023. Welcome back to the Crypto Overnighter, where we have no sponsors, no hidden agendas, and no BS. But we do have the news, so let's talk about that. Tonight, we dive into some tumultuous waters, from the legal quagmire surrounding FTX to Hong Kong's crypto rebellion against mainland China. The CFTC is setting its sights on DeFi, while Kenya grapples with the controversial WorldCoin project. The Ethereum ETFs underwhelm, and Chainalysis cuts its workforce. Buckle up, it's going to be a bumpy ride. As Sam Begman frieds trial is due to kick off today, I think it relevant to ask if we're off base on what happened at FTX. Let's start with the basics. FTX imploded last November, and the man at the helm, Sam Beckman fried faces a criminal trial that kicks off tomorrow. He's up against seven fraud and conspiracy charges. The allegations? Misappropriating billions in customer funds. Noted author Michael Lewis defended FTX on CBS's 60 Minutes. He claimed FTX was, quote, a real business, not a Ponzi scheme. But let's be clear. Federal prosecutors have a very different view. They questioned FTX's entire legacy, calling it a short-lived venture built on shaky ground. Now, here's where it gets interesting. FTX was founded in 2019. By 2021, CNBC reported its revenue had skyrocketed to over $1 billion, up from just $89 million the previous year. But hold on, bankruptcy proceedings tell a different story. By the end of 2021, FTX and its sister company, Alameda Research, had racked up $3.7 billion in operating losses for tax purposes. So where did that money go? Prosecutors allege that customer cash was mixed with assets at Alameda Research. The total shortfall? A staggering $8 billion. That's $8 billion of customer funds that went missing. Now, Lewis argues that FTX would still be profitable if traders had not withdrawn their money en masse. But let's not kid ourselves. Exchanges are supposed to hold one-to-one deposits. FTX failed to do that. It admitted to not having segregated reserves of customer assets. That's not just bad business, that's illegal. Lewis's defense of FTX has stirred the pot, especially for anyone skeptical of centralized exchanges. His comments come at a time when the crypto community is already on edge about regulatory scrutiny. His statements could be seen as an attempt to legitimize a business that federal prosecutors have labeled as fraudulent. But let's not forget, FTX was one of crypto's largest exchanges before its downfall. What does the crypto influencer cast have to say on the subject? Dan Held, a prominent figure in the crypto world, called it shameful for Lewis to defend Bankman Freed. Why? Because exchanges can't handle deposits like banks do, at least not legally. The case against FTX and Bankman Freed is a stark reminder of the risks involved in centralized exchanges. Unlike decentralized platforms, centralized exchanges like FTX hold customer funds making those customer funds vulnerable to not only misappropriation, but hacks and embezzlement as well. It's also worth noting that FTX's downfall was not just a result of legal issues. The exchange faced a massive withdrawal of customer funds, forcing it to admit that it did not hold segregated reserves. This is a breach of trust that no decentralized system would allow. So what's the takeaway here? FTX is a lesson in the importance of regulatory compliance and financial transparency. It's a wake-up call for those who think they can skirt the law and still come out on top. All right, you've just gotten a reality check on FTX. From one legal quagmire to another, let's pivot. Is Hong Kong having its own crypto rebellion defying mainland China? Folks, if you thought FTX was a roller coaster, strap in for this one. Don't forget to hit those like and subscribe buttons for more insights. The last few nights, we've been talking about JPEX and their legal issues in Hong Kong. So this came after loosening the restrictions on crypto trading for retail investors on the island city. But for tonight, let's ignore the trouble with JPEX and talk instead about Hong Kong's growing role in the East Asian crypto landscape. This is a seismic shift that could reshape the power dynamics in the region. Hong Kong has emerged as a potential tailwind for East Asia's crypto volumes. Why? Well, China's anti-crypto regulations have led to a plummet in trading volumes. But Hong Kong is defying the trend. A recent Chainalysis report reveals that Hong Kong traded approximately $64 billion in crypto between July 2022 and June 2023. That's staggering, especially when you consider that Hong Kong's population is just 0.5% the size of mainland China's. 
Hong Kong's crypto-friendly stance has led to speculation that China might be warming up to digital assets. Could Hong Kong be China's testing ground for crypto initiatives? It's a possibility. Hong Kong operates as a special administrative region, giving it autonomy over many policies, including cryptocurrency regulation. But let's not forget the role of over-the-counter markets. These markets in Hong Kong are highly active and typically facilitate large transfers for institutional investors and high net worth individuals. In fact, 46.8% of Hong Kong's crypto trades for the year were through large transactions of $10 million or more. That's a significant chunk. And it's higher than other countries in East Asia, like Japan and the Republic of Korea. So who's using these OTC markets? According to Chinese OTC dealers, Russians and Ukrainians are flocking to Hong Kong to move their money to safety using crypto. Mainland Chinese investors are also using Hong Kong's OTC market as a fiat on-ramp to crypto, something that's difficult to do in China due to restrictions. Now, let's talk about the legal landscape. While China banned crypto transactions on the mainland in September 2021, Hong Kong's been rolling out the welcome app for crypto firms. In October 2022, Hong Kong authorities released policy statements to strengthen its position as a global financial center. By June, a full licensing regime for virtual asset service providers took effect. So what does all this mean? Hong Kong is not just a blip, it's a full-blown rebellion against the anti-crypto stance of mainland China. It's a haven for crypto investors, a hotbed for OTC markets, and possibly a testing ground for China's future crypto policies. Hong Kong is making waves, and those waves could turn into a tsunami that reshapes the crypto landscape in East Asia. Keep your eyes on this space, it's one to watch. From East Asia to US regulators, the heat is on. The CFTC is eyeing DeFi and not in a good way. Is this another arm of government we can't trust? Make sure you're following us for the latest on this developing story. You know, the Security Exchange Commission faces a lot of scrutiny on this show, but it's not all about Gary Gensler and the boys. The Commodity Futures Trading Commission, led by Chair Rostin Benham, is making waves. They're setting their sights on DeFi, and it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Benham recently spoke at the Futures Industry Association Expo. He made it clear that the CFTC is not sitting idle. They're actively targeting DeFi protocols. Just last month, the agency settled charges against Open, ZeroX, and Deridex for registration violations. Benham compared the current DeFi landscape to a road where only some drivers are licensed. Would you feel safe? Probably not. But here's the kicker. The CFTC's stance is at odds with the SEC led by Chair Gensler. When Benham calls for comprehensive crypto regulation, Gensler believes that the existing laws suffice. This regulatory rift will deeply affect how decentralized platforms operate. Benham's not stopping at words. The CFTC's enforcement director, Ian McGinley, called unregulated DeFi exchanges an obvious threat. They're taking this one seriously, folks. In the past fiscal year, the CFTC obtained penalty orders worth over $6 billion. Nearly half targeted bad actors in the DeFi and crypto spaces. Now let's talk about numbers. According to Benham, 45 of the CFTC's actions this fiscal year involved digital asset misconduct. That's over 34% of the 131 such actions since 2015. The agency is ramping up its efforts, and DeFi platforms are squarely in the crosshairs. So what does all this mean for the crypto community, especially for those of us who are enthusiastic about DeFi? Well, first off, the CFTC's intensified focus on DeFi is a clear signal that the regulatory landscape is about to get a lot more complicated. And let's not forget, this is coming from an agency that's already settled charges against three DeFi protocols recently. Benham's analogy of DeFi to unlicensed drivers is not just a casual remark. It's a warning shot. If you thought Benham was going to go easy on the industry, think again. The CFTC is essentially saying that the DeFi space is like the Wild West, and they're the new sheriff in town. This is about fundamentally questioning the legitimacy of DeFi platforms. The divergence between the CFTC and the SEC is also noteworthy. While the SEC seems content with existing laws, the CFTC is pushing for more. This could lead to a regulatory tug of war, with DeFi caught in the middle. And let's be real, when was the last time you trusted the government to get something this complex right? Benham's call for additional authority is a red flag. It's not just about amending old laws, it's about expanding the CFTC's reach into the crypto space. This could mean more scrutiny, more regulations, and yes, more limitations on what DeFi can and cannot do. In a nutshell, if you're in the DeFi space, brace yourselves. The CFTC is coming, and they're not just coming to observe, they're coming to regulate. We've crossed oceans from the US to East Asia. 
Now let's set our sights on Africa. Kenya's got its own world coin woes. What happens when governments can't keep their story straight? Activate those notifications so you don't miss out. And this is our cover story for tonight. The Kenyan Parliamentary Committee has advised authorities to shut down WorldCoin's operations and conduct a thorough investigation into the company. WorldCoin had been collecting personal data from Kenyan residents despite a court order issued in May 2023 to halt such activities. The committee's report raises significant privacy concerns, especially regarding the number of orbs or iris scanning devices in the country. The committee also suggests that the government should adopt a comprehensive framework for digital assets and revise existing regulations to address cyber crimes and tax reporting obligations. Not to take WorldCoin's side or anything, but let's talk about the inconsistencies in the government's stance. Iliuta Walu is the Kenyan ICT cabinet secretary. He's been censured for his inconsistent statements about WorldCoin's license status. Initially, he seemed to back the project but later accused it of not adhering to registration requirements. This flip-flopping has led to the committee to question WorldCoin's license claims. The committee's report states that WorldCoin started collecting data in public places on May 31, 2021, and applied for registration as data controllers in Kenya on August 22, 2022. This implies that WorldCoin may have operated for over a year without the required license, contrary to the Data Protection Act of 2019. The committee also found that WorldCoin's orbs were not approved by the Communications Authority of Kenya. Moreover, the transfer and storage of user data to Amazon Web Services servers in South Africa violated Section 48 of the Data Protection Act. Two companies behind the WorldCoin project, Tools for Humanity Corp. and Tools for Humanity Germany, are not registered in Kenya's Business Registration Service Database. This means they lack the legal mandate to transact any business in Kenya. The Kenyan government's move against WorldCoin is a glaring example of the regulatory hurdles that crypto projects face, especially those that collect sensitive personal data. This is a classic case of government overreach and a lack of clarity in regulations, leaving projects like WorldCoin in the state of limbo. The fact that WorldCoin's orbs were not approved by the Communications Authority of Kenya raises questions about the project's due diligence. While the crypto world is enthusiastic about decentralization and financial freedom, the sword of regulation hangs heavy. The Kenyan government's concerns about data protection and user privacy are valid, but also serve as a convenient excuse to clamp down on crypto projects. So what we have here is a multi-layered fiasco. WorldCoin's operations in Kenya are not just a violation of data protection laws, they also raise questions about the government's ability to regulate digital assets effectively. We've touched on legal battles and government oversight, but what about investor sentiment? Ethereum's ETFs hit the market, and let's just say they didn't exactly soar. Want to know why? Stick around and find out. Lately, we've been talking about the impending launch of Ethereum futures exchange-traded funds. Now, you'd think the launch of nine new Ethereum ETFs would be a momentous occasion, right? Well, not so fast. The first day of trading for these nine products saw a total volume of less than $2 million. That's right less than $2 million across all nine ETFs. Now, to give you some perspective, the ProShares Bitcoin Strategy ETF, which launched last year, saw more than $1 billion in trading volume on its first day. So what's going on? Investment firms ProShares, Vanek, Bitwise, Valkyrie, Kelly, and VolShares all threw their hats into the ring. ProShares launched three funds, including the Ether Strategy Fund. Vanek rolled out its Ethereum Strategy ETF, and Bitwise debuted its Ethereum Strategy ETF, among others. Valkyrie's Bitcoin and Ether Strategy ETF took the lead with around $787,000 worth of shares traded. Now, not all of these ETFs are pure Ether plays. Some of them, like Valkyrie's, track a combination of Bitcoin and Ether futures. But even so, the numbers are far from impressive. Why the lackluster performance? One reason could be that the SEC has yet to approve a spot crypto ETF. People are waiting for spot ETFs because they let investors gain exposure to the actual cryptocurrency at its current price, rather than betting on its future price. And let's face it, the SEC isn't exactly crypto's best friend. They've been dragging their feet on approving these spot ETFs, keeping Wall Street and retail investors in limbo. Another question to consider is the current state of the crypto market. Ethereum's price at the time of the ETF's launch was around $1,690 a modest 24-hour rise of just 
it's clear that the market is still wary about these Ethereum futures ETFs. Whether it's distrust in the SEC or just a more cautious approach to crypto investing, the lukewarm reception speaks volumes. And until the SEC gets its act together and approves a spot crypto ETF, it seems like these future ETFs will continue to underperform. From ETFs to the job market, Chainalysis is making cuts, and it's not just a one-off event. This is a sign of the times, folks. As always, if you want more crypto news, make sure you're subscribed. Tonight, we're diving into the recent layoffs at Chainalysis. This is a symptom of broader market conditions that should have us all paying attention. Chainalysis confirmed a workforce reduction on October 3rd, letting go of about 15% of its employees. That's roughly 135 people out of a workforce that was nearly 900 strong. This isn't the first time Chainalysis has had to make such a move. Earlier this year, in February, they cut around 40 to 50 employees. The reason? A bearish crypto market affecting the demand for their commercial products. Now let's talk about the sectors hit hardest within the company. The majority of these layoffs have impacted the marketing and business development teams, particularly those focusing on the private sector. This is a clear pivot towards government clients, which already make up 70% of the company's revenue. Their VP of Communications, Madeline Kennedy, stated that despite the layoffs, Chainalysis remains financially stable with ample cash reserves. The move is more about future-proofing the company in a volatile market than a desperate attempt to stay afloat. The crypto market's downturn is causing a shift in the tech job market itself. Data shows a surge in interest in AI jobs over crypto jobs. And that's something I'm seeing in my day job mining fiat currency as well. AI is exploding in terms of hype and breadth. It's sucking all of the oxygen out of the room in the venture capital space. Although it looks like the bubble is slowly starting to burst, given the valuations of some of the funding rounds we've seen lately. It's a seismic shift. Even as companies like Venmo, MasterCard, and PayPal are entering the crypto space, interest in crypto jobs is declining. Chainalysis, known for its collaboration with governments on crypto-related probes, remains optimistic. They're backed by Singapore's Sovereign Wealth Fund, GIC, which adds another layer of complexity to the situation. Are they pivoting towards more centralized players while the market shows signs of decentralization? The layoffs at Chainalysis are a glaring sign of the crypto bear market's impact on the industry. While the company claims to be well-positioned for long-term success, the recent cuts suggest a more cautious approach. Chainalysis has been a key player in providing blockchain analysis to government agencies, financial institutions, and cryptocurrency businesses. The company's pivot towards clients in the public sector is a shift that could be seen more as aligning closely with government interests at a time when the crypto community is increasingly skeptical of regulatory overreach. The downturn in the crypto industry is mirrored by a shift in the tech job market, with the surge in interest in AI jobs over crypto jobs. This could be indicative of a broader trend where tech professionals are hedging their bets by moving to sectors that are currently less volatile. The AI tech sector is also well-hyped, new, and absolutely dripping with venture capital money. Chainalysis is adapting to survive, but at what cost? As the company pivots towards government contracts, it's moving away from the very essence of what crypto stands for, decentralization and financial freedom. So what happened? In FTX's unraveling case, the downfall serves as a stark lesson in the risks associated with centralized exchanges. The allegations against Sam Bankman fried are severe, questioning the entire legacy of what was once one of crypto's largest platforms. Hong Kong is marching to the beat of its own drum, embracing crypto in a way that defies China's anti-crypto stance. It could reshape power dynamics in East Asia. The CFTC under Chair Rostin Benham is actively targeting DeFi protocols. With settlements already made against three platforms, the agency is signaling a more complex regulatory landscape ahead for DeFi. In Kenya, the government is cracking down on WorldCoin, raising crucial questions about data privacy and government oversight in crypto projects. It's a tangled web of regulation and skepticism. The launch of Ethereum ETFs was underwhelming, to say the least. A total trading volume of less than $2 million across nine products indicates a general distrust or perhaps fatigue among investors. Chainalysis cut about 15% of its workforce. These losses are clear victims of the crypto bear market's impact on the industry. Tonight's episode takes us through a labyrinth of legal battles, regulatory overreaches, and market downturns. From Sam's legal troubles to Hong Kong's emerging role as a crypto hub, we examined how centralized and decentralized forces are shaping the crypto landscape. The CFT's focus on DeFi protocols signals a tightening regulatory grip 
While the Kenyan government's action against WorldCoin showcases the pitfalls of data collection in the crypto space, as well as violating everything that makes crypto, crypto. Lackluster Ethereum ETF launches and Chainalysis's workforce cuts also echo the prevailing caution in the market. Each of these stories reveals a crypto ecosystem at a crossroads. The choices made by regulators, businesses, and individual actors will determine whether we move toward a future of innovation and financial freedom, or one of stifling controls and centralized power. In this volatile landscape, vigilance is not just advisable, it's essential. And that's going to do it for us tonight. I want to thank you, my listeners, because when you stop listening, I will stop talking. If you enjoyed tonight's show, then please like, follow, subscribe, leave a rating, or maybe a review. And in the meantime, we'll see you tomorrow night.